in this next part on the sequence of real numbers we will discuss a few important theorems including the cauchy limit theorems we will be looking at several examples uh, in between and uh, that's all for this lecture maybe that will be sufficient and we will be discussing one uh, or rather two important uh, uh, functions also not uh, formally but uh, a little bit informally okay so the first result is that suppose xn is a sequence for which the following limit uh, holds that limit n tending to infinity modulus of xn plus 1 by xn is equal to l then uh, where l is a real number of course then you can say that if l is between uh, 0 and 1 uh, to be precise 0 less than or equal to l less than 1 then the xn is a null sequence and if l is greater than 1 then modulus of xn is properly divergent to infinity so this is important uh, if you have a sequence of positive numbers then this modulus would mean just xn plus 1 by xn so in that case you would be able to make a remark about the original uh, sequence being divergent to infinity when l is greater than one but in general this is all you can say that uh, if you look at the modulus of the sequence then that would be a uh, properly divergent sequence diverging to infinity okay so the proof is uh, very technical let us see how to do it First, uh, we will take the case when L is between 0 and 1 and show that in this case, uh, Xn is a null sequence where you are given that limit n tending to infinity modulus of Xn plus 1 by Xn is equal to L. So, since L is less than 1 and there are infinitely many real numbers between any two real number, you can choose a real number, say K so that l is less than k is less than 1 and let epsilon be equal to k minus l so k minus l is obviously a positive number and we are given that limit n tending to infinity modulus of xn plus 1 by xn is equal to l so given this epsilon greater than 0 which is precisely this we will be able to find a positive integer n so that for all little n greater than or equal to capital N, the num terms of the sequence will lie in a in the epsilon neighborhood of L. That is, L minus epsilon will be less than modulus of xn plus 1 by xn will be less than L plus epsilon for all little n greater than or equal to capital N. And also note that what is L plus epsilon? L plus epsilon is just k, where k is less than 1. So, what we do is that using this uh, ratio uh, and uh, using this estimate for the ratio, in fact, we will make an estimate for the sequence xn. So, let us see how to do that. You want to say something about xn. So, we just uh, don't bother about saying it for random xn, but look at uh, n where n is strictly greater than capital N. Then you just look at these ratios x capital n plus 1 divided by x capital n multiplied by x capital n plus 2 divided by x capital n plus 1 and so on till x little n divided by x little n minus 1 where little n is greater than capital n so what do you know about this you know that if little n is greater than or equal to capital N, then modulus of xn plus 1 by xn is less than k. So each of these, uh, this modulus of product of these numbers is equal to modulus of xn plus 1 by xn times modulus of xn plus 2 by xn plus 1, etc. till modulus of x little n divided by x capital N minus 1. So and each of them is less than k. So the product is going to be less than k into k into k as many times as there are terms here. So how many terms are here? How will you calculate? You just notice the numerator. The numerator is starting from n plus 1 
the second one is n plus 2 and so on. So what is the last uh, numerator's index? If we can determine that, that will tell you as to how many terms are there in this product. So you have x little n here. So I want to write x little n equal to x capital N plus something. So what will be that something that will be precisely equal to N minus capital N. So little n is equal to capital N plus little n minus capital N. So you started with N plus 1. That was the first uh, fraction and then you are ending up at in a fraction whose numerator is x capital n plus little n minus capital n so therefore the number of terms in this product is little n minus capital n hence and each of these is less than capital less than k therefore the product is going to be less than k to, to the power n minus capital N because there are so many terms and each of the term is less than K right because you have taken little n to be greater than capital N there so you will obviously get such a thing okay now but what is this if you look at it carefully what is happening x n plus 1 is cancelling out x n plus 2 will also cancel out and so on so all the denominators uh, starting from the second one will cancel out with the numerator of the previous one, right? This and this xn plus 1 and xn plus 1 will cancel out and xn plus 2 will cancel out from the third term which is xn plus 3 divided by xn plus 2 and so on. So all you are left out with x little n in the numerator, everything else cancels out in the numerator and x capital N in the denominator. So this is exactly equal to modulus of x little n divided by x capital N which is less than k to the power little n minus capital N. So what can you do? You just multiply this x modulus of x capital N on both sides. So what do you get? You get 0 less than or equal to modulus of xn less than x capital N divided by k capital N. So what you're doing is you'll be uh, just writing this as k to the power little n divided by k to the power capital N. So you write it like this x n modulus divided by k to the power n into k to the power little n. Now there are several questions which may crowd your mind. One of the first one is that uh, we are saying cancel out things and uh, multiply by xn and so on. So why are you able to do that? Actually in the sequence when we are writing uh, this uh, statement, the hypothesis is saying that limit n tending to infinity modulus of xn plus 1 by xn is equal to L. So this necessarily means that in the sequence we are assuming that xn is non-zero, right? So if you want to be very rigid, you are actually assuming that xn is non-zero for all little n positive integers. Otherwise, you can say that after a certain term, at least it should be non-zero. So when you are looking at this sequence, it is after a certain term. So let us not make our life more difficult here for the time being because we have understood this very well. That uh, if it is only after a certain term, we will look at the sequence after that uh, finite term. And uh, then uh, uh, the talk is all only about limits. So it will not really matter if we leave out the first few terms which will have xn equal to 0 there. So uh, we don't bother about saying such things in great detail and just let us assume that xn is a sequence where every xn is non-zero. So this is, uh, you have to understand that after a certain stage one starts leaving out certain little uh, things like this to the understanding of the student of mathematics who is looking going through this particular proof in the sense that when we have said let xn be a sequence such that limit n tending to infinity mod xn plus 1 by xn equal to l what we are assuming 
in our in the background is that none of these extents are zero otherwise this would not have been possible then you are trying to prove some, something right so that we will keep in mind that is why all these cancellations and multiplications things are not bothering us so our first case was when this uh, limit n tending to infinity mod xn plus 1 by xn which is denoted by l has the property that 0 less than or equal to l less than 1 using that we got such an inequality and that means this inequality this one is perfectly all right because xn is after all non zero so i could actually have written 0 less than mod xn but never the list, this is perfectly okay and here what i have done is that i have written this as mod x capital n divided by k capital n into k to the power little n and this is true this particular inequality is true for all little n greater than capital n so what you are doing is you fix up your capital n so this proof is slightly uh, different in the philosophy from what you have been doing till now till now you chose an epsilon greater than zero tried to find a capital n so that a particular estimate would be true and then you said that the proof existed right something like that but here what you are not doing that you are actually using this epsilon and uh, going to say something this is just a uh, you can say it is a cog in the wheel you are not completely uh, depending on epsilon you are not going to complete the proof rather you are going to use that epsilon somehow so meaning what using that epsilon you got a capital n and then you fix your capital n and look at all n greater than capital n there you notice that what is happening is that mod xn is less than some constant times k to the power n so you have got a constant depending on that epsilon right so you are not going to vary your epsilon when you fix up you choose a little k here and once you have fixed your k you have fixed the epsilon you have chosen one epsilon greater than zero and depending on that epsilon greater than zero you have chosen a capital n so this much is done after that you have to do some more work that is what i'm trying to point out that what you have essentially got is that for after a certain uh, capital nth term you will be getting such a inequality where this is now a constant because capital n is now fixed and k is also a fixed number what is varying is k this little n this little n is any n greater than capital n so if you just look at this sequence k to the power n what can you say its limit is going to be zero because k is less than one that is what you had chosen your l was less than one so you chose a k between l and one so limit n tending to infinity k n is zero you know that because k is less than one and mod xn is greater than zero so this one is also going to zero so by sandwich theorem what do you get you get that limit n tending to infinity mod xn is equal to zero now use the fact that if the modulus of a sequence is a null sequence then the original sequence is also a null sequence so therefore limit n tending to infinity xn is equal to zero so when you are using this fact that limit n tending to infinity k to the power n equal to zero or sandwich theorem or this one here there is another involvement of some delta greater than zero some capital m positive integer dependent on delta and so on so those things are hidden in these uh, theorems which you are using this was one theorem this is another theorem this is the third theorem so you are using three previously known results to write down this here you are actually getting that delta definition of uh, limit of a sequence right and uh, the even though we named it we, we had called it the same epsilon but this guy is actually 
a constant chosen once you have fixed up what your k is so you fix up a k now this k can depend on what your choice will be so there are infinitely many choices but once you have fixed the k your epsilon is also fixed and they are actually constants now to be treated as constants now and the only thing is that for any epsilon there will be a capital n so you choose that capital n also dependent on epsilon so now your k which necessarily means epsilon and also capital N, they are all constants. I'm stressing that fact, right? And dependent on that, you get such an inequality and then you let N tend to infinity. Then this guy goes to zero, this goes to zero. The, so the sequence which is sandwiched in between also goes to zero, etc. I think this part is perfectly all right. There may be a confusion about uh, what is happening here so i hope i have made it clear now that this one is now treated as a constant okay because when you fix your capital n that means the x capital nth term is also a fixed number okay so this was the first part the second part is when l is greater than one then you will do similar type of trick what you will do is that between one and l there are infinitely many numbers so you choose a number k and now you take epsilon to be l minus k then l minus k is now going to be positive right and depending on this l minus k you will be able to get a positive integer capital n so that l minus epsilon is less than modulus of xn plus 1 by xn is less than l plus epsilon this is because of our assumption that this limit is equal to l so therefore we are able to get such a capital n now what is l minus epsilon l minus epsilon is precisely equal to k notice right so you you are essentially interested in the fact that you get a capital n so that for all positive integers greater than or equal to n modulus of kn plus 1 divided by uh, xn plus 1 divided by xn is greater than k where k is a number greater than 1 you will use this fact to show that mod xn is divergent to infinity in similar fashion what are you going to do now you are looking at again you want to write down mod xn right so instead of uh, we don't know anything about mod xn but we know about mod xn divided by xn minus 1 so we will use that fact that when n is greater than capital n we do what we do is we just write down this product as before xn plus x capital n plus 1 divided by x capital n into x capital n plus 2 divided by x capital n plus 1 and so on till xn divided by xn minus 1 and take the modulus of that so that is equal to mod of xn plus 1 by xn, XN into mod xn plus 2 by xn plus 1 and so on till mod x little n divided by x little n minus 1 very good each of them is greater than k that is what you have seen each of them is greater than k and how many are there again the counting is similar little n is equal to capital N plus little n minus capital N. So it started with capital N plus 1. It is ending at capital N plus little n minus capital N. So there are little n minus capital N many terms in this product. Each of them is greater than k. So k to the power little n minus capital N is less than this. And what is this? your xn plus 1 cancels out xn plus 2 cancels out and so on again as before so you are left out only with x little n divided by x capital n but now it has become greater than k to the power little n minus capital n so use the similar trick mod xn is greater than some constant what is that constant mod x capital n divided by k capital n into k to the power little n little n is varying little n has different values this is fixed now so little n has different values it has all values greater than capital n so it is defining a sequence and this sequence will diverge to infinity because k is greater than one 
so we had discussed this in our last lecture that if the dominated sequence see this one is a positive constant okay it's not sufficient that it goes to infinity this is also important here that this is a positive constant so since limit n tending to infinity k to the power in is going to infinity or rather is divergent to infinity if you multiply by a positive scalar that will also diverge to infinity therefore this is the dominated one and this is diverging to infinity therefore the dominating sequence will also diverge to infinity that is what you want to see so this is the proof of the result so let us look at the result once again that if you have a sequence so that limit n tending to infinity xn plus 1 by xn is equal to l then you can make a remark that if 0 less than or equal to l less than 1 then xn is a null sequence and if l is greater than 1 then mod xn is a properly divergent sequence diverging to infinity okay so this was our result now you will notice that in the result there was no mention of what will happen when l is equal to 1 so actually for l is equal to 1 you cannot make any comment so to understand that i have done a few examples and i want to go through these examples not more essentially only because they are giving you the reasoning why l is equal to 1 is dropped out from the result but also so that you get used to how to find the limit of the various sequences okay so this and later on we'll do some more so first sequence which i want to consider is very simple one just n plus 1 divided by n is the nth term so consider the sequence un where un is equal to n plus 1 divided by n for all positive integers n then you first find out what is limit n tending to infinity modulus of un plus 1 divided by un now notice that this is actually a positive number so you have to you can forget about the mod so all you get is limit n tending to infinity what is un plus 1 un plus 1 is n plus 2 divided by n plus 1 so write that down and then you divide by un un is n plus 1 by n so when you divide it becomes multiply by n into n divided by n plus 1 clear from here so this just becomes limit n tending to infinity n squared plus 2n uh, if i do the calculations correctly divided by 1 plus n whole square so what you will do is you divide the numerator and denominator by n squared both then what will you get this is equal to limit n tending to infinity this becomes 1 plus 2 by n if you divide by n squared divided by 1 by n plus 1 whole square because there is a whole square here right so now look that 2 by n is a null sequence 1 by n is a null sequence use all your algebra of limits which you know so this numerator is tending to 1 and denominator is tending to 1 as n tends to infinity therefore this limit is actually tending to 1 perfectly all right and uh, what is happening to the original sequence original sequence is what 1 plus 1 by n right limit n tending to infinity un is just limit n tending to infinity 1 plus 1 by n so that is going to 1 so in this particular example you see that if you look at the sequence of the ratios if you like then that limit is tending uh, limit is 1 as n tends to infinity and the original sequence also goes to 1 now let us look at another example here i am looking at the sequence vn where vn is equal to 1 by n so you know that this is a null sequence we have seen this uh, we have not exactly seen i think uh, 1 by n this I, I always forget what I we saw and what we didn't see. Uh, yeah, I, I think we saw 1 by n. I think we saw 5 by n also in a different context. But vn is equal to 1 by n we saw when we were talking about sequences. And we saw that this limit is going to 0. Okay. And what is happening to the ratio? Ratio, if you see, this is again positive uh, numbers. So you can forget about the modulus sign. 
So it becomes Vn plus 1 by Vn. Vn plus 1 is 1 by n plus 1. And Vn is 1 by n. So if you divide Vn plus 1 by Vn, you actually get n by n plus 1. So you are taking the limit of this as n tends to infinity. So just you divide by n the numerator as well as the denominator. You get limit n tending to infinity 1 by 1 plus 1 by n. So you get 1. So according to your uh, theorem, this guy, this uh, product, uh, this sequence of ratios, the limit is 1. But here, the original sequence is a null sequence. Whereas in the previous example, the original sequence was convergent to 1. So we'll see some more examples where uh, you'll see that uh, the original sequence may go haywire, even though the sequence of the ratios of the terms that uh, limit is actually one. So therefore one is dropped out from the theorem. Okay, anything can happen. So what is the our next example? You look at Wn, where Wn is equal to n. So what does this sequence look like? It is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So obviously this is a divergent sequence, diverging to infinity. Whereas if you look at the ratio sequence, it is what it is again limit n tending to infinity, wn plus 1 is n plus 1. So you can forget about the modulus again because uh, it is uh, all are positive terms. So it becomes n plus 1 divided by n. So that is limit n tending to infinity 1 plus 1 by n. So that is equal to 1. So the sequence of ratios of the terms is uh, converging to 1, but the original sequence is diverging to infinity. If you want 1 which is diverging to minus infinity, just multiply by minus 1 here, you will get an example. And the last example which I want to see, see, they are all actually uh, same type of uh, examples because here the calculations are easier. So we have taken just these. So just look at the sequence minus 1 to the power n into n plus 1 by n. Uh, now I am uh, completely forgetting whether we saw this sequence earlier or not. But uh, let us just see what is this sequence. When you have n odd, then you will get a negative number. When you have n even, then you will get a positive number. So at least it is an oscillating sequence, right? And how will it oscillate? Uh, when n is equal to 1, then it becomes uh, 1 plus 1. So 2 divided by 1, right? So it becomes minus 2 and when n is equal to 2, then it becomes 3 by 2. And then I think we saw this one, huh? And when n is equal to 3, then it becomes minus uh, 4 by 3 and so on. So uh, the odd terms are near uh, minus 1 and the even terms are all near 1. So it is actually an oscillatory sequence. But what happens to its uh, sequence of ratios? If you look at Zn plus 1 by Zn and look at the modulus of that, then this minus 1 to the power n modulus will always become equal to 1. So this just becomes equal to limit n tending to infinity. Mod Zn plus 1 is equal to what? n plus 2 divided by n plus 1. This is becoming 1, right? modulus of this and the modulus of Zn is equal to modulus of n plus so just n plus 1 divided by n and you are looking 1 by mod Zn so it becomes n by n plus 1 so you get this now I think you have become used to it so you get n squared plus 2n here actually I think I did this in the previous one so you get n squared plus you get this same limit right n squared plus 2n divided by 1 plus n whole squared so this limit is going to be 1 so even though in all these four examples, the sequence of ratios uh, was a convergent sequence converging to 1. The original sequence was uh, taking uh, arbitrary different, uh, behaving arbitrarily different uh, uh, manners, right? So either it was a convergent sequence to uh, 1 or it, conver it converts to 0 or it was divergent to infinity with a little bit of manipulation you can also get an example where it will diverge to minus infinity or it could be an oscillatory sequence. So therefore in the result we have left out so let us go back again once just to be very cautious about what we learned is that when we are looking at the sequence of ratios if this sequence is converging to L, then if 0 less than or equal to L less than 1, 
then the original sequence is a null sequence and if l is uh, greater than 1 then the modulus of the original sequence is diverging to infinity <coughs> excuse me and we can say nothing about what happens when l is equal to 1 that is what we have discussed now one uh, example which i want to stress on is uh, this will be very very useful when we talk about uh, taylor mclaurin series so let us just look at this uh, limit suppose i fix my x any real number and i look at un equal to xn uh, divided by x to the power n sorry divided by n factorial for all n positive integer so it looks like what it looks like x x squared by factorial 2 x cubed by factorial 3 and so on so look at the sequence of ratios modulus of that so you get limit n tending to infinity mod of u n plus 1 by u n what is this equal to this is equal to limit n tending to infinity mod x to the power n plus 1 <coughs> divided by n plus 1 factorial into a reja, into n factorial sorry huh? there is a factorial again typo so this is n factorial n factorial divided by mod x to the power n so what will happen is you can see that right this is what you want to write down and i forgot to put the exclamation mark which denotes the factorial notation so n factorial will cancel out only n plus 1 re will remain in the denominator and mod x to the power n will cancel out so it will be mod x in the numerator so it becomes limit n tending to infinity mod x divided by n plus 1 and that is equal to 0 so your l is 0 here right so that means that the original sequence is a null sequence so you get limit n tending to infinity x to the power n by n factorial is equal to 0. This uh, I beg of you remember this we will use very much when we do Taylor Maclaurin series as I said okay. So another important result is that suppose now I take a sequence of positive real numbers and consider the nth root of each of these xn's and look at the limit as n tends to infinity suppose that it exists and is a real number l then if l so you could have asked this in the previous result also that why did we talk about uh, l greater than equal to 0 and then l greater than 1 and so on why are we not talking about l less than 0 that is clear right in one of the previous uh, lectures on sequences i told you that if your terms of the sequence are positive and if it is a convergent sequence it will converge to the limit uh, to a limit with the limit uh, the limit could have to be greater than or equal to zero right you cannot have a, a sequence of positive terms converging to a negative number this we had seen so therefore l has to be greater than or equal to 0 now there are two possibilities one is when l is uh, greater than or equal to 0 and less than 1 then xn is a null sequence and when l is greater than 1 then uh, xn is properly divergent to infinity why did i have to take xn greater than 0 here because i am talking about the nth root sequence here so when i want to talk about the nth root i only can guarantee that this will be a real number if xn is greater than 0 for example if i had xn is equal to minus 1 then i could not have talked about the square root of minus 1 that would not be a real number so therefore uh, to ensure that these are all real numbers we have to take xn greater than 0 Again, a proof is actually simpler than the previous one. So let us see what is it saying that if you have L less than 1, the 0 less than equal to L less than 1, then you choose a K between L and 1 and then you take epsilon to be K minus L. Then epsilon is a positive number and depending on this epsilon, you will be able to get a positive integer N so that for all little n greater than equal to capital N, nth root of xn because this limit exists right so nth root of xn will be greater than l minus epsilon and less than l plus epsilon 
But what is L plus epsilon? L plus epsilon is just k. So just take the nth power of this whole inequality. Don't bother about this one. That is not interesting for us. What is interesting is you will get xn is less than k to the power n. And you already know that xn is greater than 0. So please excuse me. I have just written less than equal to 0. I meant 0 less than xn less than k to the power n. Okay. So you have this. Now what do you know about k? You know that your k is less than 1. So this converges to 0. This converges to 0. So the sequence which is sandwiched in between will also converge to 0. As simple as that. So this was actually easier. Okay. When L is greater than 1, you now I think you have understood how to write the proof. If L is greater than 1, then choose a K between 1 and L and choose epsilon to be equal to L minus K. Then epsilon will be positive. And for this epsilon, there will be a positive integer n so that nth root of xn will lie between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon, right? It will be in the epsilon neighborhood of L. So now what is L minus epsilon that is equal to k? So you are getting nth root of xn is greater than k and that is greater than 1. So uh, if you take the nth power of the whole inequality, you get k to the power n is less than x to the xn for all little n greater than or equal to capital N. But this guy now diverges to infinity because k is greater than 1. And this is the dominated sequence which is divergent to infinity. So the di dominating sequence will also diverge to infinity. That's all. Okay. So uh, what is basically important is this type of argument. So my advice to you people is to go through this uh, all over again. Then you will be able to uh, grasp. I think you have understood, but uh, you should be able to not only understand, you should also be able to reproduce uh, whenever there is an exam or something. So for that, you need some practice. Okay. Again, in this result also, we had uh, not mentioned anything about L equal to 1. So why not? Because we cannot make any conclusion about the nature of the sequence when L is equal to 1. So again, we will do several examples. So first example, you suppose this is an unfortunate choice. Uh, don't confuse this k with the previous k. Now my k is some positive number. Okay. And depending on this k, I am defining a sequence whose nth term un is equal to n plus 1 divided by kn. Then what can you say about uh, nth root of un? Right? That is the crucial part. So look at it slowly. We have seen uh, from our one of the previous lectures, I think the second lecture on sequence, that uh, limit n tending to infinity, nth root of k is equal to 1. This is true for any x we had proved to greater than 0. So from there, since our k is greater than 0, this one is true. Also, limit n tending to infinity, nth root of n is equal to 1. So in the denominator, what do you have? You have nth root of uh, k and this is what will occur. So this limit is actually equal to 1. That is not a problem because this one is equal to 1. This is also equal to 1. Just take a term by term product. You get nth root of kn and limit n tending to infinity of nth root of kn will be equal to 1. What about the numerator? So you want to compute what is nth root of n plus 1 and we have high hopes that will that it will also converge to 1, right? So if uh, the numerator also uh, converges to 1 and the denominator also converges to 1, then this uh, sequence will also converge to 1. So that is our ambition. Uh, we hope that it will converge to 1. So we just look at nth root of n plus 1 minus 1 and call it something. Because that uh, we want that this should xn should be a null sequence. Okay, that is our ambition. This for all little n positive integers. Okay, now what can you say about the nth root? This we had discussed some long time back. Since n is less than n plus 1. So I have been slightly careless about uh, less than and uh, strictly less, uh, less than or equal to and strictly less than and so on. But I think you can understand. Huh? So please forgive me for that. N is less than n plus 1. So nth root of n is less than 
nth root of n plus 1. I had discussed this before. So, this much is true. And what do you know about nth root of n? Here it is greater than or equal to 1. Because n could be 1. So, nth root of n is greater than or equal to 1. So, total uh, what do you get? You get that nth root of n plus 1 is always greater than 1. Okay. So, nth root of n plus 1 minus 1 will be greater than 0. I have written greater than equal to 0, but uh, actually it will be strictly greater than 0. Uh, it does not matter in the calculation which we do uh, after this, but uh, it is nice to be uh, perfect, uh, which I am not here, that uh, it is actually greater than 0. Okay. So, this is true for all positive integers. And then what I do is, I do something which we had done before. That you look at uh, 1 plus xn to the power n minus 1. So, what does that mean? Let us see. If you take 1 on this side, it becomes 1 plus xn. 1 plus xn is the nth root of n plus 1. So, n plus 1 is equal to 1 plus xn to the power n. That is okay. So, that is what I am doing. That 1 plus xn to the power n is equal to n plus 1. So, you take that minus 1 on this side. Okay. So, n is equal to 1 plus xn to the power n minus 1. This is okay. Now, if you do the binomial expansion, what will you get? You will get 1 plus n choose 1 xn, xn plus n choose 2 xn squared and so on. So, 1 will cancel out. All you will be left out with n choose 1 xn plus n choose 2 xn squared plus n choose 3 xn cube and so on. So, you, if you just fix on this n choose 2 xn square, then that is going to be strictly less than this number. Again, the same problem. Huh? This is going to be strictly less than because your xn's are all greater than 0. So, even if you don't bother about that, even if you write less than or equal to, it will not matter in what we are doing, but it is actually greater than. Okay, and what is n choose 2? n choose 2 is n factorial divided by 2 factorial into n minus 2 factorial. So, n minus 2 factorial cancels out. You are left with n into n minus 1 divided by 2. So, you just get n into n minus 1 divided by 2 xn squared is less than or equal to n. That is the crucial thing. Okay. So, this n and this n cancels out. And what do you get? You get xn is less than or equal to or it is less than actually square root of 2 divided by n minus 1 provided n minus 1 is not 0. So, it will not happen always. It will only happen when n is a positive integer greater than 2, greater than equal to 2. So, the xn is less than equal to this and it is obviously greater than 0. So, it is sandwiched between these two things and this is converging to 0, right? And uh, limit n tending to infinity 1 by root n, that is 0. So, this is going to 0. This is also going to 0. So, thus a sequence which is sandwiched between them is going to 0. But what is xn? xn was nth root of n plus 1 minus 1. So, limit n tending to infinity nth root of n plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. So, that means limit n tending to infinity nth root of n plus 1 is equal to 1. Right? So, that is what you get. So, if you take the nth root of un, right, what you will get? If you take the limit as n tends to infinity, you will get 1 because the denominator is also tending to 1 and the numerator is also tending to 1 as n tends to infinity when you take the nth root. So, limit n tending to infinity, nth root of un is equal to 1. Very good. So, you have got this for this particular sequence. Uh, that if you look at the nth root of se nth root sequence, then that is a convergent sequence converging to 1. But what about this sequence itself, the original sequence? So, you can see that if you take the limit as n tends to infinity, it is just n plus 1 by kn and take the limit as n tends to infinity. Take out 1 by k from here, you just get 1 plus 1 by n and this converges to 1. So, the limit n tending to infinity un is actually going to be equal to 1 by k. So, it is completely dependent on k. 
so if you take k is equal to 1 it will converge to 1 if you take k is equal to 2 it will converge to half and so on k was any random positive number so if you take k is equal to half then uh, this will converge to 2 right and if you take k is equal to 2 it will converge to half i think i just messed up a little bit just now but whatever so you will get various values for the limit even though the nth root sequence that limit is going to 1 so this example should be sufficient for us to say that we don't want to give a uh, definition of uh, uh, sorry we don't want to include the case when l is equal to 1 in the result but uh, like i said before i am including some more examples examples are very simple ones okay so if you take the sequence wn equal to n uh, that is the sequence wn where the nth term is n then this clearly diverges to infinity this is just one two three four etc but if you take the nth root of wn that is nth root of n so that limit as n tends to infinity will be one clear so even if the nth uh, root sequence converges to 1 the original sequence diverges to infinity similarly if you take vn is equal to 1 by n then uh, its nth root sequence is obviously again going to converge to 1 because you have 1 in the numerator the only issue will be nth root of n in the denominator so it will converge to 1 whereas the original sequence is actually a null sequence so any random thing can happen and I have taken one more example. This is slightly different from what you have been seeing till now. Till now, what we have done is that when we are describing a sequence, we are just telling you what the nth term is in one single go, right? One formula given and done. But here, what we have done is that the formula which is given is not, cannot be given actually in one uh, statement. So, the sequence which we are describing is dependent on uh, what happens when n is odd and what happens when n is even this type of thing you have seen before but that was only with respect to the sign but here we are also changing the value also right in a sense so when n is odd then it is n plus 1 by n and when n is even then it is n plus 1 divided by 2n so what will the sequence look like let me try to say uh, ad hoc way and uh, uh, i will surely make a mistake so let me try okay so when n is odd means n equal to one then it becomes two right one plus one so it is two when n is uh, two then it becomes uh, three by four when it is three then it becomes uh, four this is why i need a live student audience okay so when n is equal to three it becomes three plus one so four by three so it was three by four here then it becomes four by three then uh, when n is four it becomes five by eight i'm correct four plus one is five by eight and then it becomes uh, so this was when four right so when n is five it becomes six by five and so on i think you can understand what this sequence is uh, what is the nature of this sequence so obviously it is an oscillatory sequence it is not going to converge anywhere how are you sure about that look at this one uh, it is not clear by the numbers which i which i was trying to say just by doing some mental math, uh, mathematics right so if you look at it carefully this is one plus one by n and this is what this is half into 1 plus 1 by n so when n is odd it these numbers are getting closer and closer to 1 from the right hand side and when n is even these numbers are getting closer and closer to half from the right hand side so uh, if you imagine your real line you have this one here and half somewhere here so all the odd uh, terms are greater than one and tending towards one as if right if you just think of this as a sequence and when you are looking at the even terms they are all greater than half and they are tending towards half so there is no question of such a sequence to converge neither can it diverge properly to infinity or minus infinity
so it is an oscillatory sequence but now you see that uh, it doesn't uh, reflect your pendulum's oscillation in any sense right so unless you allow for a very erratic pendulum it is uh, actually an oscillatory sequence with an infinite oscillation not a neat thing at all but what happens to its nth root sequence we already saw in this previous example so i don't want to do it again our previous example was what n plus 1 by kn so if you look at the nth root of this this is going to 1 that is you saw for any k so in this our last example it is k is 1 here and k is 2 here so if you look at the nth root uh, if you just thought of this as a sequence that was tending to 1 and this is also tending to 1 so if you take any small neighborhood of uh, 1 all the odd terms as well as the even terms will lie in that neighborhood of 1 when you are looking at the nth root okay so i am saying that the limit n tending to infinity nth root of zn that sequence is going to 1 because of this uh, argument right uh, by the previous example whereas zn itself is an oscillatory sequence <coughs> so what have you got you have got that uh, when l is equal to 1 you can not hope for any uh, conclusion uh, about the nature of the sequence so we just drop l equal to 1 from the result so the first result which uh, after this is the cauchy's first limit theorem what does it say it says that uh, if uh, you have a sequence a n and if limit n tending to infinity a n is equal to l then if you look at the arithmetic mean sequence that is you take the first n terms add them divide by n so you're taking the arithmetic mean of the first n terms so you go on doing this so what will the sequence look like it will look like a1 comma a1 plus a2 by 2 then the third term will be a1 plus a2 plus a3 by 3 fourth term will be a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 divided by 4 and so on so this is your arithmetic mean sequence if the original sequence converges to l then the arithmetic mean sequence will also converge to l this is Cauchy's first limit theorem. What, how do we prove this? None of these results which we are doing today in today's lecture uh, are straightforward. That is, you have to be very careful as to how to proceed with the proof. You don't have a uh, straight cut formula that you just, uh, algorithm, sorry, that you just follow the definitions and you will get the result. So let us be careful about it. First, we prove the result for L equal to 0. So what do you know? You know that uh, uh, limit n tending to infinity a n is equal to 0 now, right? So if you take any epsilon greater than 0, then you will be able to get a positive integer n so that for all little n greater than or equal to capital N, mod a n will be less than epsilon by 2. The role of this epsilon by 2 I had explained in some previous uh, uh, discussion uh, it is just to make the final answer look very nice that's all okay so since a n is converging to zero we will get such a thing now uh, for this new sequence you call the nth term as s n so s n is a1 plus a2 plus etc plus a n divided by n <coughs> excuse me so what can you write about s n if you take little n greater than capital N, then mod Sn will be what? Mod Sn is equal to modulus of A1 plus A2 plus etc. plus A capital N plus A capital N plus 1 plus A capital N plus 2 plus etc. plus A capital N divided by little n. So, if you use the triangle inequality, use the uh, triangle inequality many times okay so use this one as one number and use these as the other uh, cap little n minus capital n numbers then you will get modulus of sn is less than or equal to this number plus this uh, mod of a1 plus a2 plus etc plus a capital n divided by n plus mod a n plus 1 plus a n plus 2 plus etc plus a n divided by n now what you do is that uh, you have got this n uh, which is fixed now 
because it is dependent on epsilon you have chosen right there exists a capital n and you have chosen this capital n so you notice that since 1 by n is a convergent sequence so this one this first uh, term in this uh, summation is also uh, going to be a null sequence because the numerator is just a fixed constant so it is a null sequence therefore you will get some n1 positive integer so that a mod of a1 plus a2 plus extra plus a n divided by n this will be less than epsilon by 2 again so the trick which you have used many times use that you just take n to be greater than equal to the maximum of capital n and n1 okay so then what do you have you have that this is also true that for uh, little n greater than equal to maximum of n and n1 mod an is less than epsilon by 2 as well as this inequality is true so if you would substitute here for all n greater than equal to maximum of capital n and n1 mod sn will be less than epsilon by 2 from this first one and how many are there again you count same counting capital n plus 1 till capital n plus little n minus capital n so so many things uh, each will be less than epsilon by 2 so epsilon by 2 into n minus capital n by n is this okay this 1 by n you take uh, common here then mod a n plus 1 is less than epsilon by 2 right mod a n plus 2 is less than epsilon by 2 and so on till mod a n and how many are there there are n minus capital n time many so you'll get n minus n times epsilon by 2 and 1 by 1 n is left out as it was so this is true and what can you say about this this is what this is 1 minus capital n by little n so this number is less than 1 so therefore you get this is less than epsilon by 2 plus epsilon by 2 that is less than epsilon right because n minus capital n by n is less than 1 n minus capital n is less than capital uh, little n so therefore this number is less than 1 Hence, this total thing becomes less than epsilon by 2 plus epsilon by 2. So, less than epsilon. Therefore, you have got that for the sequence Sn, if you take n greater than equal to max, and for any epsilon greater than 0, you will be able to get a positive integer such that for all little n greater than equal to that positive integer, mod of Sn will be less than epsilon. So, that means what? That means that limit n tending to infinity sn is equal to 0. So, Cauchy's first limit theorem is true for l equal to 0. Okay. So, what about when l is not equal to 0? Then instead of the sequence a n, look at a n minus l. So, what was given? Given was limit n tending to infinity a n equal to l. So, what can you say about limit n tending to infinity a n minus l? That will be equal to 0 right so by what you have already proved so a n minus l is a null sequence so if you look at a1 minus l plus a2 minus l plus etc plus a n minus l divided by n and if you take the limit as n tends to infinity this will also be equal to zero by what we proved just now now what is this equal to i'm going just backwards okay so the how many l are there 1 l for a1 1 l for a2 n 1 and so on 1 l for a n there are n many l's here so this is just equal to a1 plus a2 plus etc plus a n minus n l divided by n so I, I have written this separately so just cancel out l from here what do you get you get a1 plus a2 plus etc plus a n divided by n minus l so what was this we denoted this by s n so this is sn minus l so we see that if, since an minus l is a null sequence this limit uh, as n tends to infinity is going to be zero therefore limit n tending to infinity sn minus l is also going to be zero that means limit n tending to infinity sn is equal to l this is your cauchy's first limit theorem okay
now i have to digress a little bit i have to talk about e to the power x so i'm not going to spend too much time on this because uh, by our next semester actually uh, hopefully we will be, be able to understand this much better in fact in the next uh, lecture itself we will see that uh, this type of uh, uh, sequence okay so even though it doesn't look like a sequence at all uh, let me call it by its proper name this is a series and uh, what are you doing you take any x in r and look at 1 plus x plus x squared by factorial 2 plus etc plus x j by factorial j plus etc so keep on adding x to the power n by n factorial to the previous thing you will get something which will actually be a real number for every x this we will prove in the next chapter actually and uh, before that we also we will discuss it will be clear when we discuss it so for the time being you believe that this is a real number this real number is called the exponential of x okay and ex exponential of 1 is given a special uh, symbol it is written as little e e is for euler Euler was very modest, so he used a little e to denote exponential of 1. And it can be shown that this definition makes sense that for any x, exponential x is actually equal to the number e to the power x. Okay, so this will make sense. And there are some properties that it is increasing and so on. What is crucial for us is that if you look at any convergent sequence Sn, then e to the power limit n tending to infinity Sn is going to be equal to limit n tending to infinity e to the power Sn. So basically, I uh, this is one property which is very important that e to the power x plus y is equal to e to the power x into e to the power y. That will show you that e to the power x is greater than 0. And this one can be proved that uh, it is a, uh, if x is less than y, then e to the power x is less than e to the power y. That is the function is increasing. So I've tried to draw the graph. This graph in blue is the graph of y is equal to e to the power x right so it keeps on increasing and as uh, it is always positive and as x tends to uh, uh, minus infinity your uh, the value of y will go towards zero and it increases very fast as you can see from this graph this uh, blue line is y is equal to x's graph and uh, this is in comparison with that okay and uh, not only that uh, we also have another function which is called the log function and how is it defined using the exponential function that if you take any y positive then uh, you will always be able to get an x a real number such that e to the power x is equal to y this can be proved so this fact is written as that we say that log y is equal to x so log uh, is always defined only for a uh, positive number and uh, again look at the graph here the red uh, graph is for log x so it is only defined for x positive as x goes towards zero it tends towards minus infinity and it also is an increasing uh, function right it keeps on increasing but the increase is slow that is quite clear from this graph see how fast this one goes and this is this is also increasing it will keep on increasing but the increase uh, the rate of increase is going to be slow and if you just compare it with this line y is equal to x it almost looks like y is equal to log x is the mirror image of e to the power x and that is not surprising because uh, log is the inverse function of e to the power x so that is what i want to say i don't know whether i have said it here or not maybe in the next slide yeah, I've said it here itself that if I take any x in R, then log of e to the power x is x. And if y is greater than 0, log is only defined for positive numbers. So e to the power log y is 1. Also, log is an increasing function. This is what is meant by increasing function. If x is less than y, then log x is less than log y. This can be proved. Log 1 is going to be 0. Log x y is equal to log x plus log y. All these are... Uh, properties which can be shown and will be shown uh, when we discuss the definition of uh, e to the power x and log x later on 
and for the time being which one is interesting for us is that if i have a sequence of positive uh, numbers which is converging to a positive number then log of the limit uh, n tending to infinity sn is equal to limit n tending to infinity log sn okay so uh, please keep this uh, graphs in mind which it might help uh, it should help actually and uh, apart from this i also need the fact that a to the power x can be defined for any a greater than 0 and for any x in r for some special cases you need not have a to be positive for example if you have minus 3 to the power 2 that makes sense minus 3 to the power 2 is equal to 9 but in general if you want to define a to the power x then you need your uh, a to be positive and x to be a real number and the definition is precisely equal to e to the power x log a so you realize there is a log a here so therefore a has to be positive and using the fact that the log and exponential uh, satisfy this nice properties that it can commute with the limit right for log also and for exponential also so that is also true for a so a to the power limit n tending to infinity sn is equal to limit n tending to infinity a to the power s so these properties we are going to believe for the time being so if you believe this then the cauchy's first limit theorem immediately tells you that if your sequence is a sequence of positive numbers and if it converges to a positive number then if you look at the n nth geometric mean right the, the geometric mean sequence right so this means just what that the first one will be just a1 the second one is square root of a1 a2 third one is cube root of a1 a2 a3 fourth one is fourth root of a1 a2 a3 a4 and so on so you have this geometric mean sequence this will also converge to l and how do you prove this the proof is the following that uh, since you have this already limit n tending to infinity a n is equal to l so you apply log you will get limit n tending to infinity log a n is equal to log l by what we saw just now apply log on both sides and then commute log with limit you will get this so if you write down s n to be equal to log a1 plus log a2 plus etc plus log a n divided by n then this is what this is equal to uh, since you have this property that log xy is equal to log x plus log y so using this property you we will get log of a1 a2 etc a n to the power 1 by n and you know that since limit n tending to infinity log a n is log l so limit n tending to infinity log s n will also be equal to log l since this is equal to log l this limit so this limit is also log l that is Cauchy's first uh, limit theorem now what is this this is just limit n tending to infinity log of a1 a2 a n to the power 1 by n so you apply exponential on both sides so exponential will also commute with the limit that is what we said and exponential of log is identity so it becomes just l here right exponential of log e to the power log y is y this we know so use that so you get you only get l here and this e exponential log this becomes identity for this one also so you get the result so this is a consequence of uh, cauchy's first limit theorem and what does cauchy's second limit theorem say it says that if you have a sequence of positive numbers and if limit n tending to infinity a n plus 1 by a n is equal to l is positive this is also necessary then the nth root sequence will also be equal to l so if you have a sequence of positive real numbers for which the ratio sequence is a, uh, converging to a positive real number then the nth root sequence will also converge to the same positive number so how to do this what you do is you take b1 equal to a n uh, sorry b1 is equal to a1 and then you let b2 is equal to a2 by a1 b3 is equal to a3 by a2 and so on so bn is equal to an divided by an minus 1 for all positive integers greater than equal to 2 then if you just multiply 
you see b1 b2 b3 etc bn what will you get you will get a1 into a2 by a1 into a3 by a2 etc an by an minus 1 now you see this a2 will cancel out a3 will cancel out and so on an minus 1 will cancel out and of course a1 will also cancel out sorry so all these things will cancel out you will only be left out with a n so b1 b2 b3 etc bn multiplication of these n terms of this new sequence is actually equal to a n okay so then what do you get you have limit n tending to infinity bn is equal to l why because limit n tending to infinity a n plus 1 by a n is equal to l this is given and what is bn bn uh, bn plus 1 is an plus 1 by an right so therefore uh, it doesn't matter if the first term is a bit different after the second term onwards it is just this sequence so limit n tending to infinity bn will also be equal to is actually equal to l now take log on both sides you will get limit n tending to infinity log bn is equal to log l so therefore by Cauchy's first limit theorem, you will get limit n tending to infinity log b1 plus etc plus log bn divided by n is equal to log l, right? And what is this uh, term actually? It is just log of b1, b2, bn to the power 1 by n, right? This is just this. So limit of this is equal to log l. And what is b1, b2, bn? That is just an. So it becomes limit n tending to infinity log of an to the power 1 by n is equal to log l. So if you apply exponential on both sides, you will get your result that limit n tending to infinity an to the power 1 by n is equal to l. Okay. So we will end this uh, by just looking at one example. Um, what did we say that if you had any sequence and if you had the sequence of positive terms and if you looked at the uh, sequence of the ratios and if it converged to a positive real number then the nth root sequence will also converge to the same positive real number so what we now want to show by this example is the converse is not true that is if you look at the nth root sequence and if it converges it does not imply that the ratio sequence will converge okay so for that what i have done is i've taken any two numbers a and b positive numbers which are different a is not equal to b and you are looking at the sequence it is easier to see it like this a a b a squared b a squared b squared a cube b squared and so on so what are you doing you start with a then multiply a b with it you get the second term then you multiply an a to it to the second term you get the third term then you multiply a b to the third term you get the fourth term and so on so the general formula is that your odd term will look like a n b a to the power n b to the power n minus 1 and the even term will look like a to the power n b to the power n i think it is clear right so in this sequence what you do is that you look at the even terms first and look at the 2nth root of x 2n so that is easy that is a to a b whole to the power n divided by 2n 2nth root means x 2n to the power 1 by 2n so it becomes a n b n whole to the power 1 by 2n so that is equal to a b whole to the power n divided by 2n so n n will cancel out so it is actually uh, 2nth root of x 2n is actually equal to square root of a b for every positive integer what about the odd terms so if you forget about the limit for the time being if you look at the 2n minus 1th root of the 2n minus 1th term what you have to do is a n b to the power n minus a to the power n b to the power n minus 1 whole to the power 1 by 2n minus 1 so what you could do is you could take a b to the power n minus 1 together that is what i have done forget about the limit for the time being so you get a b to the power n minus 1 divided by 2 to the power n minus 1 and what is left out is 1 a extra right so into a whole to the power 1 by 2 n minus 1 i think i am correct uh, when I, you can understand what i am trying to say 
So if you now take the limit as n tends to infinity of only the even terms, then what is happening, uh, only the odd terms, what is happening? This is the classic case of what we had discussed there, right? Some time back. Uh, this one. A to the power limit n tending to infinity Sn is equal to limit n tending to infinity A to the power Sn. So that is our situation here, right? Limit n tending to infinity AB to the power something into A to the power something. So the limit goes on the uh, top as a power, right? So what is n limit n tending to infinity n minus 1 by 2n minus 1? You just uh, divide by n both numerator and denominator, you will get 1 minus 1 by n divided by 2 minus 1 by n. So as n tends to infinity, it becomes half, right? So this one is going to square root of AB. And what about this one? Limit n tending to infinity 1 by 2n minus 1 will become 0. So uh, this becomes a to the power 0, therefore you get a 1. So if you just look at the odd terms and look at the limit as n tends to infinity, it is going to square root of AB. And the even terms, if you look at the 2nth square root, and uh, then they are actually equal to square root of AB. So what can you say? You can say that if you look at the original sequence and look at the nth root sequence of that, its limit is going to be square root of AB. Right? Because the odd terms are tending towards square root of AB. So means if you look at square root as uh, small neighborhood of any small neighborhood of square root of AB, all the even terms are actually going to be square root of AB. So they lie in the neighborhood and the even odd terms are tending towards square root of AB. So after a certain term, all the odd terms will go and sit inside that neighborhood. So since these two things are happening, you can say that the nth root sequence is actually converging to square root of AB. What happens to the ratio thing? So write down x2n plus 1 divided by x2n. So what is x2n plus 1? Let us see. So x2n minus 1 is this. So x2n plus 1 will be what? How do you get? Instead of n, you write n plus 1. So you'll get 2n plus 2 minus 1. So you'll get 2n plus 1. Correct? Uh, instead of n, if you write n plus 1, then you will get x2n plus 1. So that is equal to a n plus 1 b to the power n, right? So a to the power n plus 1 b to the power n and x 2 n is a n b n. So cancel out whatever can be cancelled out, you are left with a. What happen, happens to x 2 n divided by x 2 n minus 1? x 2 n is a to the power n b to the power n and x 2 n minus 1 is a to the power n b to the power n minus 1. So again cancel out what, what, what all you can cancel out, you will be left with only b. But what happens now? This is all of these are equal to A, all of these are equal to B. So, can you uh, get that uh, limit n tending to infinity x n plus 1 by x n exists? It doesn't exist because if you look at this type of terms, they will all be equal to A. This type of terms are all equal to B. So, it is actually an oscillating sequence. So, this does not exist, whereas the nth root sequence exists. Uh, its limit exists actually. Okay. So I think uh, this is all right and uh, this was slightly heavy due to you, I think. Uh, so please, uh, I would request you to uh, just go back and uh, uh, see this all over again. Do it on your own so that it gets uh, clear to you. And if not, then you can always uh, ask questions.